a smooth transition. <laughs> How about Bobby and the band? Aren't they great? <laughs> yeah, I'm just a, I'm blessed to be a part. There's power in story. We watch TV, we go to the movies. Um, certainly the Bible, without the stories, we wouldn't have the winds, wisdom, insight, and direction uh, that the characters would have shared. Uh, certainly people like Moses and David and Peter, Paul, Mary. <laughs> uh, humble, broken lives that are used to tell his story of grace and mercy and compassion and certainly his love. I'm sharing a story today with you straight from the halls of Celebrate Recovery. Six years ago, I wouldn't have told anyone, not even my wife. Since then, I've learned that my story wasn't only for me, but for others, and today, my story is for you. I pray that it's a blessing and helps you in your Christian walk. So. Hi, I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ who struggles with a sexual addiction and codependency, uh, food issues, and a bunch of other things. My name's Jim. Uh, you guys know the vernacular. <laughs> vernacular. Um, yeah, my name's Jim Atkinson. I'm the ministry leader for Celebrate Recovery. Before I start, I just want you to embrace the biggest concept, I guess, of my story, and that's that God loves you. I mean, we hear it all the time. You know, we sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. We always hear it, but I don't think we ever really fully embrace how much he really loves us. But he is crazy about you. He thinks the world of you. He thinks everything of you. And you need to embrace that before we go any further. Because if you don't embrace that, then anything that I share is worthless. So embrace that today. God loves you. Amen. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would use my words to greatly impact the lives of those who are here. I pray that my story would reach deep into the hearts of those who are listening and encourage them to have a closer walk with you. Let me be hidden in everything I say and everything I do and let you be seen in everything that happens. We give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I was born in Philly, Aramingo Avenue, for those of you who know that. Uh, we moved to Washington Township when I was six. I lived in New Jersey most of my life, except for a couple years in upstate New York. Um, had a pretty normal family life. Mom, dad, two older sisters. Learned chivalry at, at an early age, by the way, two older sisters. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> my parents were very supportive of me, especially when we realized we, I had musical and creative talents. Um, as far back as I remember, I had always been seeking God, looking for my place in the big picture and, and the meaning of life. I grew up Catholic. My parents were pretty solid in their faith as I grew, uh, and they tried to give us the best upbringing they could. And the best example I have of this, <laughs> you'll like this, the Christmas Day, 1966. Anybody around Christmas Day, 1966? Love you guys. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I just forget I had to ask. Because you experienced this if you were in the area. Uh, we had a three-day nor'easter. Uh, and I think to date it's the largest white Christmas we've had. The most snow we've had white Christmas. We had four-foot snow drifts. We couldn't find our car. So um, my parents really believed in going to church. But we couldn't drive. We couldn't find our car. So my dad bumbled, bundled the five of us up. And we walked down to the Black Horse Pike, half a half mile away, and we hitched to church. And a guy, a guy in a VW Beetle picked us up. <laughs> how about that? Isn't that funny? But that's how much church meant to them. But when I got to church, it, it didn't mean anything. I never got anything out of it. It never clicked. You know, I couldn't understand why people would sit, stand, and kneel and do all that stuff and then kill each other getting out of the parking lot. It never made, <laughs> never made sense to me. But that's what it was. That was what church was to me. So um, my home, we were really huggy, uh, really huggy family. I still am very huggy, so if I hug you, I'm sorry. Um, but I am. Uh, but my mom was very nurturing and always baking. Um, Dad was old school. He was a functioning alcoholic. He didn't really show emotion. You gotta have a hand, there's a belt in your future. That's kind of how it was. 
Um, I know now that my dad had a very difficult life. He had to drop out of high school to, to work so he could support his family, but he eventually got his diploma and his certificates in computers, and that was his personality, computers, ones and zeros, black and white, you know? Um, and my dad treated me like his dad treated him. I was never good enough. I couldn't do anything right. I used, he used to get angry and frustrated at the, the stupidest things, like putting up Christmas lights or something. Um, and I never really thought that he liked me. Um, and he never really shared his feelings. And I found out so much later, after he passed away, um, how much he cared. In one of his dresser drawers, he had one of every one of my concert programs. But I never knew. It was a really powerful moment. But it's ironic that in his dresser drawers was where my addiction started, as I found the men's magazines in there years earlier. And imagine the images of the, the seeds of curiosity started at that point and carried through most of my life. High school was pretty normal. You know, I drank a little more than I should, but so did my friends and whatever. Um, but it was no big deal. But it was at this time that my porn addiction really took off. Driven by the magazines, I stepped into the real thing of a relationship way too soon and has sex as a sophomore. And that started my thirst and drive for sex. And dating after that became all about getting that sexual high and not about relationships. My addiction followed me into college as I got my music teaching degree from Glassboro State, now Rowan. <laughs> I was planning to play percussion with the Philly Orchestra. Yeah, I was going to be timpanist to make 100000 a year. That didn't happen. <laughs> but I found that teaching really allowed me to reach people, so I went into that profession instead. Uh, I got my master's degree in percussion performance at Ithaca College and went straight into teaching. First a year in New York and then 25 in New Jersey, 24 of them in West Stepford. Throughout that time, all of my relationships were skewed and based around sex. Uh, even the long-term relationships were broken, and I thought it was then. I returned to New Jersey where I re-met my wife, re-met my wife because we had dated in high school. We dated for a year and broke up for nine, if you want to say it that way. We re-met. Um, our first re-date in December was looking at Christmas lights and we fell back in love. And she was a born-again Christian, invited me out to GCCC, where around 100 people met at the Pittman PMC uh, about uh, almost exactly 30 years ago. Yeah, I'm old. Uh, <laughs> But we've been coming to church that long. Um, a week later, I met with Pastor Bruce in his office and prayed to receive Christ. Um, and a week after that, 10 years and two days from our very first high school date, we eloped to, to Virginia. So don't judge me. <laughs> you guys eloped? We've made it right with God. It's okay. But yeah, it's a longer story than you want to hear. Um, but at this time, I didn't realize I still had an ongoing problem with sex and pornography. All the broken relationships up to this point were everyone else's fault, not mine. And that was my denial. But I have to tell you, to this day, my wife continues to be, to be my absolute best friend, my confidant, in everything I could have ever wanted. And that closeness would get us through the tough times that lay ahead of us. But during the next 25 years, God allowed me to touch so many lives in the creative arts ministry here at church. I was a strong part of the Christmas and Easter productions, other productions. I was writing original music for productions. We were writing dramas. I was a member of the band Cornerstone, where we played concerts and saw lives changed. We did the production The First Stone. We did an album called It's Your Time. As a teacher, I reached young lives with music and, more importantly, the love of Jesus. I was able to invite them to church and, and be Jesus to them, and, you know, and love them. It was my pulpit was what I felt I was called to do, and I did it, I thought, really well. I was able to be a blessing to people at the local and state band directors associations. I received the Gloucester County Teacher Recognition Award as Teacher of the Year in 95, 1995, and in 2006. So frankly, I couldn't have asked for a better life. I had a great wife, three great kids, a great job, some cool family vacations, and a great ministry life most of the time still alongside this really great life. There was this underlying thread of an addiction to pornography. I would confess it, I'd find myself in places I didn't want to be, and confess it and be okay for a while. I tried to get rid of the addiction on my own so many times, so, so many times, but it kept coming back. 
I was fighting a fight that I couldn't win on my own. And by the way, you're not supposed to be in the ring with the enemy. Just remember that. It's not your fight. It's not your fight. And to be honest, I didn't think that much of my addiction. I knew it was wrong, but I figure every guy struggles with it, right? And who knew that it would grow and eventually change the course of my life forever? Because I had given 95% of my life to God. 95%. I was in ministry, I was serving and changing lives, uh, serving in a bunch of different areas, uh, but I knew that I had to get rid of my addiction, but, but I thought, oh, I have it under control, I'm, I'm good, besides it wasn't hurting anyone, or so I thought, more denial. You know, I even for, got free of my addiction for three whole months, I allowed it back in my life. And once it came back, it had a greater grip than ever. Enemy was in, in the parking lot doing push and push-ups, just waiting for me to fall again. My life changed forever the morning of Thursday, December 11, 2008, at 6.35 a.m. Amazing how you remember those pinpoints, eh? 6.35 a.m., a little over six years ago. I was arrested that day for having illegal pornographic files on my file, on my computer. I downloaded them. It was a marked file by the police, and I downloaded them and deleted it, but the fact remains that they were still there. It was a place I never wanted to go, but it happened. So as I sat in my house, and later at the police station, as I was charged with the crime and fingerprinted, I was forced to come to the grips, to come to grips with my addiction head on. I couldn't hide from it any longer. It was the biggest hurt I've ever had in my life, and I was powerless to go back and make it right. My, my personality is melancholy and phlegmatic, as you know the personality types, at least the ones we talk about here. I look for a peaceful resolution, but I always look for the right way, and I couldn't go back and make this right. It was really hard. It was crippling, and it was hard to breathe, but on that cold, rainy December day, I knew I had to give God 100%. 95 wasn't good enough anymore. There was no holding back. And I felt like the rain was God crying tears saying, look how far you've come. Look how far away you've gotten. And I was crying a lot of tears that day too. So began the toughest journey of my life. I met with my amazing teaching colleagues who were devastated. I met with Pastor Bruce that same day who gave me Genesis 50-20 which says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. At that point, I didn't know how this was all going to work out. I was meeting with the school, that was hard, meeting with the creative arts staff, uh, my amazingly awesome lawyers to determine my fate. I had to explain it to my wife, my kids, my mom, and my sisters. It was really hard. It was really shameful. My family and a lot of my friends were more than understanding and very supportive. I'll never ever forget what my daughter said um, the day I told her why I was arrested. She looked at me and said, Dad, it's okay, everybody messes up. I went, wow, what grace and forgiveness. I certainly didn't deserve that. So two days later, there was a healing service at church and I came forward. And as I was prayed for, I could feel God just washing over me. And it was as if he was saying that if I trusted in him, that he would see me through and make it all okay. Amen. <sighs> Amen is right. I didn't realize how far I'd strayed, and I didn't realize how much closer I would eventually get. Now, all that hurt got exponentially harder. You're thinking, wow, it's already hard enough. got harder when a week later... All that hit the media when they had a press conference and announced the sting operation that I was a part of. So now my name and my face were splattered across news, radio, and TV um, as one of many who were arrested. So here I was, this poster child for sin, and my very, very private sin of pornography was exposed to the entire region, the tri-state region. Now for me, I couldn't see why God would allow it. I'm like... God, you know I have a heart for you. Why? You ever have those really God moments? Really? You know, why would he purposefully and seem to undermine everything I was doing 
everything I was accomplishing in school and church, I had gone from a seemingly upright Christian man to a shameful nothing. And one day, my very private sin had hurt thousands of people. I mean, my family and friends and the staff and students at my school, all the past students I had taught, the church, uh, my band director friends throughout the state, it was everybody. I'm like, wow. Now imagine this, 10 days earlier, I was given this speech at the National Honor Society for the National Honor Society as Teacher of the Year. And here I was shamed, ashamed and broken. Now, ironically, in the speech, I told the NHS students, never say I wish I had. And here I was living out my own advice. This was worse than a fatal flesh wound. Many times I felt like my heart was going to burst right out of my chest. The pain and the hurt and the shame and the anguish just felt like it was too much for one person to bear. It turns out God had plans for this becoming public, too. The day after it hit the news, my best friend called me and said, hey, I've been struggling with the same addiction. And we've been walking the walk ever since. And it was at that point I knew that my story wasn't just for me. I realized, okay, he's going to get me clean, but there's a bigger picture here. Um, and I knew at least at the onset it was to help others wake up and get sober regarding their issues and their addictions and whatever they're struggling with. And I knew, obviously, especially pornography. Uh, some fathers even shared with me that they had that important discussion with their kids about uh, the internet and pornography and sex. So I was blessed that they were having that discussion, I guess. And I knew God would work it out for his good. Um, Romans 8, 28, we all know it. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and those who have been called according to his purpose. But at this point in time, I didn't see how. I couldn't really see anything at this point in time. There's so many months of hurt and pain and anxiety and shame that would happen. But I know that God, I know now that God never wastes the hurt. God never wastes the hurt. Whatever you're going through, he's not going to waste it if you let him use it. So through a plea bargain, I was forced to give up my teaching license, but I, license, but I asked myself, where and how would I work? You know, would I, I had a pension that was almost 25 years. I'm thinking, how oh, am I going to lose this? And what would be the legal issues? Would I go to jail? And would God really want that? I didn't know at that point. I have to tell you, our church was amazing to me. They stood right beside me the whole time, the entire walk. They had known me for almost 25 years, but they didn't have to support me at all. And they did. They allowed me to serve in the background, which helped with my self-worth, because obviously I felt like nothing. And they gave me guidelines, one of which was to go to group for my addictions. That's when I went to Celebrate Recovery. I knew about CR, but I thought it wasn't really for me. I was pretty sure it wasn't for me, actually. I thought it was for people with really big drug and alcohol issues, and obviously I wasn't going through that. Still in denial. But like so many people who walked through the doors, I was at my lowest point. But when God is our only answer, we are right where he wants us. How about that? When God is our only answer, we are right where he wants us. So I was really nervous that first day at CR, I have to tell you. I knew about it, but I'd never been. But I was warmly greeted with every, from everybody who was there. And to my shock, hey, guess what? They actually have a group for men's sexual addictions. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? Um, and we have a lot of groups for a lot of different things, by the way. But uh, as I attended Friday nights and I worked the step study, which is a separate part, I realized that I needed to be accountable for my, my actions and be willing to let God change me. I could just sense that this was the real work of healing and recovery. It's where it was going to happen. The next few months were really hard. It seemed that any of my court appearances made the newspaper, really. And it seemed like when everything, when something happened to another teacher, it gave them a reason to put me in the papers again. I was like, gosh, really? But the consequences of my sin could have been so much greater. God's hedge of protection and his purpose for my life brought me through. I pled guilty to the lowest level felony offense, and God allowed me to only receive five years of probation, not jail time. And as I said, I lost my teaching license. I have to tell you, I missed the possibility of going to jail by one day and an amazing, because of the grace of God and an amazing lawyer um, who's now become an insanely close friend that I love dearly. Now, during this time, my amazing wife said, you know, I guess if God doesn't give us more than we can handle, I guess he must think we can make it through this. And I thought, well, yeah, I guess so. 
you know. And so I needed to work, and I called a close friend who owned a construction company, and he hired me the very next week. It was only God. And the CR was in a step study answering those difficult but needed questions to the best of my ability. And my amazing sponsor helped me through every single phase, and I found out more about myself than I ever thought possible. And as I watched my addiction slowly fall away, I realized how skewed my relationships really were. I mean, I would loved people, but gosh, it was different now. You know, it, you're, when you've been broken, you love from a different place. You just, you do. Listen, I have to tell you, step four, where you list all your good and bad things, is really hard. Because I was looking at my life events, and it was very, very sobering. But I have to tell you, after I shared that inventory with a sponsor, so a person I trusted, I can tell you that the, the burden of sin I felt lift off of me. It was, it was a freedom I've never experienced before. God gave me verses during this time. Psalm 55, 22 was the one that really stuck out. I've written, or read the psalm so many times, and I passed over this. But Psalm 55, 22 says, Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. So I'm like, oh, please, don't let me fall. You know, I've already fallen far enough. Bless you. <sighs> he also gave me Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. We did the first part, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. But it continues. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. 100%, not 95 anymore, 100%. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. And that's God's plan for restoration. Romans 9, 17 says, I raised you up for this very purpose. I'm thinking, this very purpose? But I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. One of the reasons why I'm sharing today, proclaiming his goodness to all the earth. Here are some of the highlights from just the first year of my recovery. First, I was able to retire from my job before all the legal things came to bear. And that meant that as I retired, I would get all my unused sick days. Praise God for teaching. Uh, <laughs> but it was exactly the finances we needed. I mean, he provided like crazy stuff. I got a job in a jobless market doing things I never thought I could do. Um, shoveling and mixing more than six tons of concrete some days. Have you met me? Six tons of concrete. I mean, really? <laughs> but he caught me through it. And I was removed from visible service here at GCCC, but I was able to serve in the background. And because I was out of work for a while, God gave me the time and the ability to be able to create the majority of the Easter production that year, which was love so amazing. That was his gift to me, and in turn, my gift to you. Is that crazy? It's cool stuff. But only he could have allowed that. I was able to serve uh, playing, uh, I couldn't play on the platform, but I was playing in Celebrate Recovery, and that's where the band Spirit Driven was born. Um, and we still are used for his glory. We played both nights of music along with Wade last year. That was Spirit Driven plus Wade. I mean, so he, he created that out of something that didn't exist before. Pretty cool stuff. I frankly never thought I'd play again in a service. I thought I was done. This is pretty cool. Having 24 years of service teaching, I needed to get 25 so I could get my pension now and not when I was 60 because obviously we needed the finances. Um, I was able to buy back a year from New York and the state, uh, the education department allowed it to happen without a problem. So that was the first part. I established 25 years, but having established that, they had to still give me the pension. And July 2nd, of that year, I was allowed a full pension and received back payments from the date of my retirement. Now, nobody that worked with me to get that paperwork done, nobody thought it would ever happen. They said, you have to do this, but you know, you have half a percent that this will even happen. Only God. God moved great mountains on my behalf. Yeah, amen. <laughs> it's just crazy. Now, the course story continues. This is, uh, this is, this is so not my story. Anyhow, it's so God's story. It continues. I was out of work at the end of September, again, 
Uh, there was nothing in construction. So I had nothing to do. Whenever I would, had nothing to do, I would just come to church and just sit around and see if I could bless people. Um, it turns out at the end of September, I was about to get a blessing. Pastor Bruce and Cheryl mentioned that there was an opening at church, and they offered it to me. I have to just tell you, tears just streamed down my face as God was going to take this broken and shameful and seemingly useless life and use it again for his glory. It was just crazy. And I have to tell you, it's funny. I told them yes. I didn't even know what the job was. I had no idea what it was. I was just like, yes, I'm in. What am I doing? <laughs> um, but I just knew God would give me the abilities. I just knew that he would. So I was hired as director of advertising and changed by the word production assistant. Now think about that, director of advertising. It's quite poignant that now I was negotiating with the same media that had crucified me earlier, TV and radio and newspapers. They called me for work. Does God have a sense of humor or what? You know? I was just so, I'm like, really? This is funny. So I was restored at the church, uh, playing on the platform, and I play whatever they need, bass, sax, drums, keys, something, whatever. Uh, God has allowed me also to write dramas for our weekend services. He's uh, given me the insight since to be able to have the opportunity to be a part of the productions uh, for I Am and King of Glory and Victorious and Crown of Splendor and Love Wins, uh, our Christmas production, The Holiest Night in Peace. And uh, we're now obviously working on the, the next one coming up, a Palm Sunday weekend, Almighty. Um, start getting the word out about that, by the way. Uh, it's going to be cool. Um, but who would have thought? I also function uh, assisting Brian uh, Ross as a graphic designer um, when he needs it or has the time and opportunity allow. And every time I see artwork I've done, I think, God, it's so good. Now, three years ago, the church asked me to step in as interim director of Celebrate Recovery. And I thought, that would never, ever have been in my future. I was now restored to a place of teaching again. I thought I'd never teach. I was now restored to a place of teaching again, this time helping others who are struggling. How cool is that? It's pretty neat. And I'm also executive contact, contact for Pastor Bruce's books, his book series. I'm one of the contacts for that. So all great things. And I know God's not done yet. Trust me, there are still hurts I'm working through. Thoughts of half of my life teaching, my love of teaching come back all the time. You know, as a music teacher, we went on great trips. We did Boston and Chicago and Williamsburg and Toronto and Niagara Falls. We actually took them to Disneyland. And uh, one year, we actually took the band to the New Year's Day Parade in London. I mean, it was, it's been a crazy amount of experiences God allowed. But small things bring back the hurts. Sometimes it's a song. Sometimes it's even like the smell of grass. You know, how can you avoid grass, you know? But it, it's like the marching band thing comes back, and I just think back to that and go, wow, I, just, I miss that sometimes. But you know, the pain reminds me that God has done a greater thing. It keeps me sober and keeps my testimony, my story for people fresh and real and honest and open. Amen. And I'd rather have that than anything. So a year and a half ago, God did another amazing thing. My wife joined me in the ministry of Celebrate Recovery, meeting the needs of our children of hurting families in Celebration Place. So now we serve together changing lives, which is really pretty cool. Here are some insights that God's given me through this walk. First of all, as I said, it's not our story, it's his. You know, we get to be a part of it. And he tells it his way for his glory. And I encourage you, don't compare your story with anyone else's. You know, I see it all the time. People, you know, have a great healing and other people have struggles that they have to work through. And they're kind of at the same place, but they don't have a different end. But God's got different stories for each one of us. He just does. So try not to compare your walk to anybody else. Just walk your best walk. Your trials aren't for you. And as you overcome, your testimony, your testimony is going to help others to overcome. Like, I hope mine is going to be for you. I've learned that you can't do it alone. Everyone struggles with something, you know, whatever they are. But with God's help and the support of ministries like Celebrate Recovery, you can have victory because we come alongside you. Sins, I've learned, sins must be brought into the light to take away the power that the enemy has. You know, if you have something you're holding in the darkness, the enemy is winning. He's just winning. And we can't let them win. And we need to bring it into the light. God will do whatever it takes to draw us closer to him. He'll use trials and hurts to bring us to brokenness and repentance. 
Once, once there, he'll use prayer and others in our lives to help us heal and restore. As I started, you know, God loves each one of us. And I know that what he did for me, he longs to do for you if he hasn't already. We just need to trust and obey. I have to tell you, my vision of God has changed. You know, I don't know about you. I always keep finding myself putting God in the box and trying to comprehend him and who he is and what he does. And he doesn't exist in space and time. You know, and I'm always going, but God, I, I understand you. And he's like, no, you don't understand me. You know, my ways are not your ways. We don't get it. But it, and I know he can do immeasurably more than we could ever dream because I've seen it in my life. I have to tell you, because I've seen the Lord move mountains on my behalf, I know he can move mountains on your behalf. I just know he can. If he did it for stupid head Jim, just me, I'm just Jim, he can certainly do it for you. Now, as I said, I see people with, with, with a, a greater feeling now. I have a true heart for people to know Jesus personally. I learned early on that healing and restoration are lifelong pursuits. Okay? It'd be so nice to pull up to the rest, you know, the drive through and go, could you give me some help for my anger issue? <laughs> you know, it'd be really nice to do that, but it's, that's not what it is. It's, it's a lifelong pursuit. It's not something that happens in an instant. And we always look for progress, not perfection. So hear this. We must come face to face with God because, before he can change us. We must come face to face with God before he can change us. Face to face with God is a scary place. Because if you're face to face with God, everything's in the light. That's scary. First time I read that, I went, oh. <laughs> but it's scary. But if we're honest, if we all have, you know, for anybody with a belly button, <laughs> okay, for those of you who don't, see me afterwards. Uh, <laughs> but anyone with a belly button, we're struggling with stuff. We just are. But the Lord has them in our lives so that we can look to him for him to take them away. So here it is. You know, what, what areas might you be hiding from God? You might not even know it. I mean, I didn't think mine was such a big deal, but he did. And certainly he'll reveal it. And I don't say that to condemn you. I say that to encourage you because whatever the issue it is, he placed it there to bring you through it so that he could show his glory through you and then use you to reach others. It's a process. Have you ever noticed that God pours salt in the wounds that grieves him most? <laughs> I find this all the time. You know, if you lack patience, he puts you in traffic. <laughs> <laughs> if you're angry, he puts you around people who make you angry. All those people, they make me nuts. If you have control issues, he places you in issues where you're out of control. You can't control anything. I mean, think about it. Think about your life. What can we control anyhow? You can't control people. You can't control situations. You can only control your reactions to them, really, right? It's how you handle it. So maybe you're struggling with anxiety or depression. Maybe you're giving way too much. It's a skewed relationship and a codependent relationship, and you have no boundaries to say no. Maybe you have no boundaries because you feel like you're not good enough, and you know that's wrong. Maybe you overwork because of perfectionism. Maybe you struggle with abuse and you're, you're working through the long-term effects and unforgiveness. And maybe you have something you never thought about that you're working through. Uh, overeating. I know God's brought my food issues to, to bear. I'm like, ah, really? That's why my vest isn't buttoned. <laughs> Just being honest. You know, but maybe you're struggling with overeating or control or gambling or lying or overspending. Or, there's just so many things that you might be struggling with. Maybe you have an addiction you know about and you can't stop. You know, our, biggest pride, our biggest stronghold is pride. You know, we think we can handle it. I thought I could handle my stuff. I have it. I never did. And we can't handle it without God and others. And that's what Celebrate Recovery is about. It's a place that feels like home. I hope you, those of you who come feel like it's home. It's safe and comfortable, and it, even more so, it's confidential. It's a place where you can share your burdens and bring that stuff that you're carrying into the light. You know, we don't judge you. We don't try to fix you. As I said, you know, uh, wouldn't it be nice to fix people? You know, I, I know I have a list of people that I would love to fix, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but we can't. And n none of them are my wife. Don't go there. Okay. Uh, she's amazing. 
Um, but, you know, we just come and walk alongside you. You know, the, 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 the name of the program is so deceptive because it's, it, we're recovering from so many things. You know, so many things in our lives. But, and we just come along and, and love you. And just let, we give you the tools through the program, through the ministry, to allow you to succeed and overcome the things that are beating you down. So, um, you know, I still struggle. And when somebody looks at me with condemning eyes, and it happens, you know, I, I realize, like David, that my sin is ever before me. It just is. But I also know Psalm 26.3 says, His unfailing love is ever before me. And I embrace that with all I can. Um, do I have it still? I did. I've been sober six years. Amen. <laughs> all glory to God. But trust me, if I can do it, so can you. I mean, I thought there wouldn't be a day or a week or a month that I wouldn't struggle somehow. And God has brought me through so much. And I was thinking, as I was writing this testimony a while back, that if a little over six years ago, God said, I'll give you a million dollars, you have to walk this walk. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, I would have taken the money. Because I wouldn't have wanted to walk that walk. That was a very hard walk. It's still not always easy. But now, having gone through it, the closer walk and the deeper walk and the greater understanding and the greater love for people, I wouldn't trade it for anything, you know? And, that, and that's kind of what I want for you at this point in time. And so, you know, I, I'm going to ask you that same thing. You know, how about you? You know, where are you in all of this? Because my story was not for me. My story is for you. So if we could bow our heads and close our eyes. Just let God talk to you. Just let him reveal what he has for you in this quiet moment. And just ask yourself, what's the thing that the Lord keeps bringing to your mind that you're saying, yeah, I just really need to bring that into the light. I just really need to let it go. And you just really need to be honest. Nobody needs to know but you. You know, if he reveals it, you need to deal with it. But the biggest thing you need to know is that you're not alone. There are people who struggle with the same thing. And God knows, and he wants to bring you through it. So if you want to start on that road to healing and recovery, if that's you today, I'm just going to ask you to do something scary. And while heads are bowed, all heads are bowed and all eyes are closed, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand and just say, yeah. I need to get it. I need to bring it into the light. If that's you today, if you could just raise your hand and say, yes, yes, yes. Be honest. It's just between you and God. Just be honest. We all have stuff. Yes. Thank you. All across the room. Be encouraged. You're not alone. Okay, you can put your hands down. And if you've never, ever experienced the Jesus that we're talking about, if you've never given him your life and experienced that personal relationship, you can do it today. You always say it's not about the church. It's not about anything except the relationship between you and a God that loves you. It's easy as ABC. We just admit that we fall short of the glory of God. We know that we mess up. We sin. But B, believe that God did something about it by sending his son to Donna Cross to pay that price. He knew you would fall short, but he gave an answer. And that's Jesus Christ. And C, commit your life to him from this day forward. And we always say, D, do it today because we really don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. So while heads are still bowed and eyes are closed, I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer, something like this. Just pray it in your heart. Just say, Father in heaven, I'm sorry for the things that I've done that are wrong. I know I've messed up. I know I'm a sinner. But I ask that you would forgive me in this moment. Thank you for loving me, sending your son to pay that price that I could never pay. See, I commit my life to you from this day forward. Holy Spirit, come into my heart. Jesus, be my Lord and Savior. I thank you and praise you for all you do. In Jesus' name.